Thank you so much, Bert. And thanks everyone for joining. It's nice to see a lot of uh, new names, also some old friends on the list as well. So uh, thanks everyone for hanging in here with us for the next hour. Um, I've intentionally created a provocative title uh, in part because I want to raise what I think is probably the biggest challenge facing our field of pharmacopedemiology. And I want to also present um, the beginnings of what I think is a solution to help us improve the situation. Um, I'll leave plenty of time at the end for questions and for discussion. I'm hoping that we can use some of that discussion to uh, talk about the proposed solution and also maybe to brainstorm a little bit together. So in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the promises and also the perils of pharmacoepidemiology. And I'm gonna put this in the context of COVID-19. I feel like no epidemiology seminar can uh, cannot start without COVID-19 these days. And I'll talk specifically about a tale of three observational studies around the drug hydroxychloroquine. We'll then go into three non-COVID use cases that further illustrate the problem that I'm trying to raise, but also begin to hint at what I think is uh, the right long-term solution for addressing that problem. And the solution is really uh, in, will be presented in the form of an improvement in the overall evidence generation ecosystem, as I'll describe. So let's start with COVID-19. Um, and with respect to COVID-19, what we've seen with pharmacoepidemiology is it's created a great opportunity for pharmacoepi to really highlight its strengths. That is, uh, in pharmacoepidemiology, we typically use routinely collected electronic healthcare data that are rapidly available, often in near real time. And so in a pandemic situation, pharmacoepidemiology, as we're trying to understand both the potential benefits and harms of medications, um, provides some great opportunity to do that really quickly using these data. At the same time, access to these data, which are widely ubiquitous, um, is easier to come by than the training to analyze the data to do a good study. And, and that's the inherent problem is that we have a lot of access to data um, and we have less access to the training to do uh, proper studies in the data. And on top of that, um, we have a situation where most of the consumers of the research using these data are not equipped to be able to separate the good from the bad studies. And so in a nutshell, there are a number of really good pharmacopoeia studies that come out. Um, there are probably more bad studies that come out and we don't have a process once they're out to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. And this is just an illustration that I found that shows how many different uh, initiatives and data sources and data networks that have been emerging in the COVID context producing so quote unquote real world data. And so as you can see, there's just tons of data flowing in. Um, everyone has access to these data to do um, various types of analyses. Um, and this is inherently the, the challenge that we're trying to address. I'll talk about three studies that I think nicely illustrate this problem. Um, they all focus on this drug hydroxychloroquine, which probably needs no introduction. We've heard a lot about it since March. Um, the three studies are all observational studies and they're all very similar in a lot of ways. They all focus on patients with COVID-19 in the hospital setting. They compare patients in an observational uh, study who received hydroxychloroquine to patients that did not. Um, and then the outcomes in each of these studies were mortality or some composite outcome containing mortality. Uh, one was published in this journal, Med. Um, it's a cell journal. One was in the New England Journal, and the other was in the International Journal of Infectious Diseases. And I'll, I'll quickly give some background on hydroxychloroquine in case uh, you're unfamiliar with it, but it's a, a drug that's been around for a long time. It's used uh, fairly routinely to treat certain autoimmune diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis. It's also um, used to treat uh, and prevent malaria. And there was some early evidence back in March of this year that suggested that it could be a potential treatment and prophylaxis for COVID-19. So there were some in vitro studies that showed that, especially at high doses, um, certainly doses higher than those that are used in rheumatoid arthritis, um, the drug could inhibit uh, SARS-CoV-2 replication. And so there was a lot of early interest in whether um, whether it could be used as an actual um, therapeutic in, this, in the pandemic setting. Uh, it comes, of course, with certain potential safety concerns, most commonly uh, noted as the risk of serious heart rhythm problems. 
as you mentioned, all three of these studies were very similar. So at a, at a high level, they're all trying to address the same question. There's some nuances in the differences in the data sources. They, all the data come from electronic health records uh, from, uh, from institutionalized settings. Um, there's some differences in the patient characteristics. There's some differences in the design and analysis strategies. But overall, they all have the same types of patients, intervention, comparator, and outcome. And what's striking is despite the similarity in what they're trying to do and what they're trying to study, they give wildly different results. So the, the first paper that came out was this one by Magignoli. So this is the one uh, that was published in uh, med, uh, medicine. It found a hazard ratio of 1.83, suggesting that if you're treated with hydroxychloroquine and you have COVID, it may increase your risk of death. Uh, the second study, the one in the New England Journal, suggested that there was no impact of hydroxychloroquine on death. And the third one suggested there was a huge protective benefit of hydroxychloroquine on death. And so we have three studies um, all trying to answer the same question. And on the basis of these results, any possible answer, any answer is possible. Um, and what this has led to is uh, a lot of confusion. So there are, of course, media outlets that then will, um, will promulgate these study results. So here's the first one, this Magignoli paper that suggests that hydroxychloroquine is increased to mortality uh, in, in veterans with severe COVID-19. Uh, the president of the United States picks up on uh, pharmacoepidemiology for the first time. You'd think that um, Finally, pharmacoepidemiology has really made it when the president of the US is tweeting about it, but he's tweeting about a study that, um, despite based on large sampling, as he put it, found a result that's probably quite implausible. Um, and the third one, uh, the, the one that found a null result, is probably the one that not only got the least attention, um, but also is the one that's probably getting closest to, right, to the right answer. And that's now been confirmed by several randomized trials. So the, the, there's this one trial that was funded by the National Institutes of Health that was halted um, because they determined that there was no um, possibility that within the context of the trial, hydroxychloroquine was gonna demonstrate a benefit. And so it was stopped early. The results haven't been published yet um, beyond this press release from NIH. Um, and then the recovery trial platform out of the UK has shown pretty convincingly with results that are now published that hydroxychloroquine doesn't have a beneficial effect in patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And if anything, there may be some suggestion of a potential harm. So here's the overall mortality curve uh, for patients randomized to hydroxychloroquine versus standard of, standard of care. And you can see the hazard ratio is a 1.09. Um, and this was consistent across multiple subgroups analysis, analysis that they did. So um, I think where we are is that we have lots of opportunity to generate lots of real world, quote unquote, real world evidence using these real world data. Um, COVID-19 has shown that to be the case. Um, and it, 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 I think what's lost is that there is some signal in a lot of this noise and we need to be better at identifying which are the studies that are producing the valid results. So now switch gears a little bit and talk about, uh, switch away from COVID and talk a little bit about three specific use cases that I think further illustrate some of the problems with bias in pharmacoepidemiology, but also then show how we can use fairly simple strategies to detect when bias is occurring. Um, and we're gonna build towards what I think is a larger sort of systematic solution to being able to not only improve the overall um, evidence base in pharmacoepidemiology, but then to allow us to more quickly identify when studies are published with bogus results. So first focus on this example of beta blockers and um, COPD exacerbations. And as you may know, um, there's a general sort of clinical gestalt that you should avoid use of beta blockers in patients with COPD. Um, so beta blockers, um, by blocking the, the beta receptors on the lungs can cause bronchoconstriction. And there's concern that in patients with COPD, that bronchoconstriction can, uh, can have adverse outcomes, including exacerbations of the underlying COPD. Nevertheless, there have been a lot of studies, observational studies that have looked at whether the use of beta blockers can improve clinical outcomes. So cardiovascular outcomes, which is what they're intended um, 
to improve, especially in patients who, are, uh, who have just had a heart attack, for example. Um, a number of studies have also looked at actually whether beta blockers can improve COPD exacerbations, that is reduce exacerbations themselves. And this is a meta-analysis that was published about six years ago of a handful of observational studies that on the balance suggested that in contrast to uh, our clinical uh, sort of thinking, there's a suggestion perhaps that beta blockers when given to patients with COPD could actually reduce COPD exacerbation. Um, so these are all studies based on administrative claims data and electronic health record data. Um, they're observational, which is a potential problem here. We, uh, so I worked with a, a fellow in our division at the time, Yahweh Dong, who, um, who together with uh, me and others thought these results seem sort of fishy. And so we designed a study to replicate what's been done, but we also built in an, an analysis that would tip us off to whether uh, that, that finding may be the result of bias or whether it may in fact be causal. And everything that I'm going to introduce in this section of the talk is really simple strategies for detecting bias in electronic healthcare data. There's no fancy causal inference methods, it's all very simple um, critical thinking and clinical thinking applied to these database problems. And so we constructed a study cohort to resemble some of the studies that were uh, published prior to this one using a bunch of different databases. We focused on cardio selective beta blockers. So beta blockers that are thought not to act on the beta receptors in the lungs, but be more specific to those in the heart. We compared them uh, to patients who were initiate, initiating certain types of calcium channel blockers. And, uh, and as you can see, and as we might expect, patients who are initiating these two different types of drugs, these are all patients who have COPD and they've all had a heart attack, are different in a lot of ways. So on average, the beta blocker patients are a little bit younger, but they have certain um, characteristics that suggest that they're different in other ways as well. So they have fewer outpatient visits, fewer um, outpatient visits specifically for cardiovascular disease. Um, they have fewer outpatient visits related to pulmonary related episodes. Um, and so that is suggestive that maybe patients who are actually less severe in terms of their COPD may be preferentially receiving the cardioselective blockers. And that was exactly the hypothesis that we went into this with. They also used many fewer drugs than the patients that use calcium channel blockers. And across the four uh, or the three, in this case, different databases that we used and across multiple different analytic strategies that we tried to use to do the best we could with administrative claims data to answer this question, we got results that were almost perfectly in line with what was observed in that meta-analysis. So our main analysis suggested a halving of risk of COPD exacerbations associated with use of the cardioselective beta blockers as compared to the calcium channel blockers. And so this, um, this to us um, was interesting that we were able to replicate it. It also demonstrated just how, uh, how sort of robust this finding is in terms of um, its perseverance through lots of different analytic strategies. The analysis that we designed to detect whether we think this may be causal or bias is that we said, okay, if this is true, if, if beta blockers can actually reduce COPD exacerbation, we suspect that that's less likely to be the case in the really short term. That is uh, immediately after patients initiate the beta blockers, um, we wouldn't expect to see an effect, even if in the longer term, they could have some uh, some effect on the COPD exacerbation. So we focused an analysis specifically on the first 30 days following treatment initiation. So we uh, identified the patients who are initiating the beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. And within the first 30 days, we reanalyzed our outcome of COPD exacerbations based on hospitalizations for COPD. And we again found after adjustment, in this case by a propensity score, results that would suggest that within 30 days, if you're given a beta blocker, you have a 45% reduction in COPD exacerbation, which is just unbelievable. Um, and so when we wrote this paper, we wrote it within the frame that um, there have been lots of studies trying to answer this question. We don't think that claims data are suitable for this question. So claims data 
lack what we think are really important potential confounders for this association, including COPD uh, severity, lung function, whether patients smoke, and so forth. And, we, and so we think those are the unmeasured confounders that are driving this result. Um, and so we sort of cautioned to say that, you know, this is, we've reached the limit in this particular context with what we can do with claims data. We don't think that it's possible to answer this question with claims data. And I think this is one of the important parts of the evidence generation ecosystem that I, that I want to drive towards at the end, which is that as a field, we need to get better at knowing what questions we can and cannot answer. Um, I would put this one squarely in the in the space of this is a question that at least with administrative claims data alone, we have no chance at answering correctly. There was just last year a randomized trial published uh, to answer this question. It was one that we had referenced in the paper itself to say that um, we think that this is biased. We will know for sure when this randomized trial comes out. And sure enough, it was a study that randomized patients with COPD to either metoprolol, a specific beta blocker, or to placebo primary outcome of interest was exacerbation of COPD, and there was no effect. Um, no effect in the long term, certainly no effect within the first 30 days. Um, and then when they looked at patients with severe or very severe exacerbation, exacerbation of COPD, there's actually some suggestion that uh, metoprolol would be harmful, kind of going back to where we started. This is probably why physicians are not prescribing these drugs to patients with COPD for exactly this this concern, there may be bronchospasm, and that channeling of, of the severe patients away from the beta blockers then is why we're seeing such biased results in the observational studies. Okay, so that's, that's uh, use case one. The second one is a more recent example of a class of drugs for quinolones, which are antibiotics that have been associated in now a handful of studies with an outcome of either aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection. Um, aortic dissection occurs when uh, the layers of the lining of the aorta begin to separate, and then an aneurysm can happen uh, when they rupture. Um, and it can be very severe, and, and usually at the time of aneurysm, then fatal. Fluoroquinolones are an interesting class of drugs. They've been associated with lots of other adverse effects, including um, disorders of the collagen. So there's concern that they cause tendonitis and tendon rupture. Um, and so there's, some, there's uh, some good evidence to suggest that there could be a mechanism behind this effect. Um, what's also interesting here is that it's an effect that's observed very quickly. So fluoroquinolones are typically given in short courses. Um, and you know, for seven, 10 or 14 days. And um, the results or the uh, outcomes also manifest in very short order as well. Um, so this meta-analysis in particular of these four studies found that there was a two-fold increase in risk or rate of aortic aneurysm or dissection associated with fluoroquinolones. Again, these studies are heterogeneous and uh, in the comparisons that are being made and even in the study design, some are cohort studies and some are case control or, or case crossover studies. Um, but we said, this is again, one that we're suspicious about. Um, this seems implausible that there could be such a big effect um, when patients get even a whiff of these drugs. And so, uh, so we wanted to design a study that would allow us to detect whether this result could be biased. We developed the study kind of modeled after this particular paper here by Pasternak et al., which is a cohort study that compared fluoroquinolones to patients who initiated another class of anti or another antibiotic, amoxicillin. And when we replicated that study um, as best we could with a different data source, but using the same design, using the same covariate adjustment, um, using the same analysis approach, we find a result that's very similar to theirs. So the unadjusted result that we find is pretty similar to the overall meta-analysis result. And this 1.54 is very similar, just skipping back for a moment, to this 1.66 that Pasternak et al. found. Um, but we had a suspicion that maybe this is not causal. Um, maybe it's not even confounding, uh, but maybe it's a surveillance bias problem. Um, that is, if you have patients who have a urinary tract infection or they have pneumonia um, and they're treated with drugs for those conditions, um, it may be possible that incidentally, we pick up 
cases of aortic dissection in particular, when imaging is done to, uh, to rule out other, um, other uh, diagnoses for, uh, for what really is that underlying infection. Um, and so we said, let's, uh, once we have done the replication, we can see that we observe similar results as the prior studies. Let's require that the patients at baseline, so before they get the antibiotic within a fairly short window um, and before we start follow-up, all have some sort of baseline imaging that would in expectation pick up an incident aortic dissection. Um, so we can sort of emulate what we, how we would enroll patients in the randomized trial. That is, if we were interested in aortic dissection and it's typically something that is uh, pre-existing for a long time before it becomes clinically manifest, um, we would expect that incidental findings at baseline um, would be ruled out, right? If we re require everyone to have that imaging that, that would in, in pick it up. And when we did that, um, it completely explained the bias. Even in the unadjusted analysis, we went from 1.9 down to, to a null effect estimate here. Um, and we saw a similar finding in the adjusted analysis. And so this was a fairly simple thing that we could do um, in the context of the study. We were able to replicate the bias and then make it disappear by um, imposing a very simple strategy to detect what we think was the, the primary source of bias here. I will note that in a, a separate analysis that we did where we focused specifically on patients with pneumonia, we did continue to see an elevation in the risk. Um, and this one is a little bit hard for us to interpret because there were few outcomes in that analysis, only 48 in total. The comparison group that we used was suboptimal. We used azithromycin, which is probably uh, the closest comparator for, uh, for this analysis, but still there probably are differences in patients, uh, even if they have a diagnosis of pneumonia who are getting azithromycin versus fluoroquinolones. And then because the cohort size was small, um, we weren't able to actually implement this baseline restriction. And so we only have the results with no imaging restriction. So we can't say for sure whether the entire finding is a result of this form of surveillance bias um, until we're able to get more data and implement the same sort of strategy here for these patients with pneumonia. Okay. The third and final example that I'll introduce is one that we're actively working on now. Um, and it's a story of a drug interaction between opioids and what are known as gabapentinoids or um, gabapentin or pregabalin specifically. So these are drugs that are um, anti-epileptics, but they're also used for neuropathic pain. Um, and they are among the most commonly used drugs that are concomitantly used with opioids. Um, and so they're often used with opioids to treat neuropathic pain when the opioids themselves are not providing sufficient pain relief. And there's been some studies, um, some basic science and, and also some basic clinical studies that have shown that gabapentinoids in and of themselves can potentiate respiratory depression uh, which is one of the main manifestations of overdose in opioid. And so there's concern that um, if administered concomitantly, the gabapentinoids by potentiating that respiratory depression could actually increase the risk of overdose with the opioids. And in fact, there was a case control study in Canada published just a few years ago that found a, about a 49% higher odds of overdose when patients receive both opioids and gabapentinoids compared to when patients received opioids alone. This was another example where when we saw this, it's intriguing, right? There's some basic science evidence to suggest the mechanism of action. Uh, these are drugs that are very commonly used together. Overdose is obviously a very important outcome. And there's even some epidemiologic evidence to suggest there may be something happening here. Uh, this is another case though, where when we first looked at this, our initial thought was there, there has to be some confounding here. That is the patient, although patients um, who get opioids all of course have certain characteristics all, are all being treated for pain. Some of them may have certain um, issues with dependence and so forth. The reason that someone gets gabapentinoids probably also has to do with some of those same factors. And, um, and we weren't convinced that studies using claims data alone would necessarily be able to account for that. So we're conducting a study, um, it's not completed yet, but we're conducting a study to 
use a cohort study to try to address this question. And the first thing that you'll note in our table one is that when you compare patients who are on opioids, so these are all patients who have used opioids for at least 90 days, and then we identify patients uh, in that cohort who initiate gabapentinoids, and we compare them to patients who have been on opioids for the same duration of time, but at that time had not yet initiated the gabapentinoid. And what you see is that the characteristics between those two, are, two groups are quite different. So the age and the proportion uh, that are male are fairly similar. But when you look into some of the medication use, anticonvulsants is a little bit different. Antidepressants is very different. It's about 49% versus about 38% in the gabapentinoid versus comparator group. Um, some differences in benzodiazepine use, hypnotic use, and pretty big difference in muscle relaxant use, suggesting these are indeed two very different groups of patients, even though they all have been using opioids for, um, for a certain amount of time and for the same amount of time on average. And then when you look into some of the comorbid conditions, you see more of that same story. There's higher prevalence of depression among the gabapentinoid initiators, there's more fibromyalgia, which makes a lot of sense. That would be the primary indication for the gabapentin use here. There's some imbalance even in um, a proxy for opioid dependence and abuse. And I say proxy because these are all administrative claims data and we know that um, certain conditions like opioid dependence, abuse, alcohol use and, and so forth are, um, are under captured in these data. And if we look at neuropathic pain, that's quite different as expected. One thing um, that we did in baseline, so before the start of follow-up, so before patients in the gabapentinoid group initiate their treatment and before patients in the comparator group um, are followed at a similar index date, we characterized the, um, the utilization of the opioid as best we could. And this will by far be the most important measured risk factor for the outcome, that is overdose of opioids is gonna be driven um, predominantly by one's consumption of, of their prescription opioids. Of course, there are other unmeasured confounders that we can't account for here. So illicit use of opioids, illicit use of other medications and so forth. But when we looked at one measure of how much opioid use there was between the two groups shortly before the start of follow-up, it was quite different. So, in the, so these are uh, total morphine milligram equivalents, which means that there's a, there are conversion factors to put each of the different opioids onto the same scale to uh, kind of compare uh, utilization of opioids in terms of um, equipotent doses. And so we've converted everything into morphine equivalents here. And then over the 60 days, on average, patients in the gabapentin group have 5,500 milligram morphine equivalents versus 4,300 in the comparative group. And so that's a, you know, that's a pretty big difference and it's concerning. Um, it suggests that, as you might expect, the patients who are getting gabapentinoids probably have worse underlying pain, especially at the time that they're initiating the gabapentin. They probably have ramped up their opioid use trying to control the pain. Um, and maybe that's not cutting it. So now they're adding the gabapentin on top of that. Of course, once we adjust for all of this using um, fancy propensity score stratification and weighting methods, those differences in measured characteristics go away. But you worry that even though we've adjusted for our best measured fact, a measured variable that's a risk factor for the outcome, that there's still some underlying difference in the severity of the pain and therefore the consumption of the opioids that goes beyond what we can see in the administrative claims data where we see what's dispensed, but we don't see how the patients are using the medication within those dispensings once they bring it home from the pharmacy. And so when we conducted our analysis, our kind of naive analysis, as I'll call it, um, we find something very similar to what was observed before. So our unadjusted analysis is a, has a ratio of 2.85. Um, our primary analysis, and we also use the high dimensional propensity score approach, um, both our primary propensity score weighted approach and the HDPS approach provided results that were very similar to what we saw from that case control study, which showed a, an odds ratio of uh, 1.49. So we get exactly the same hazard ratio, appreciating that's a different um, measure. We get um, very similar results overall to that case control study. In this case, instead of a 
negative control outcome like we looked at with, uh, with the COPD and beta blockers instead of a um, requirement that we have the baseline imaging as in the case of the fluoroquinolones and the erotic dissection and, and aneurysm. What we did here was we said, why don't we look at a sort of a, a measure in follow-up that would be indicative with the, you know, within the claims of whether there's different use of the underlying opioids between the two groups in the early follow-up period. And so we, as I showed you on the prior slide, we were able to adjust as best we could for the baseline use of the opioids leading up to the time of initiation. But if, the, if we haven't fully accounted for the differences in the pain severity and the differences in how they're actually using the opioids at the time of initiation, then we'd expect to see differences in the, the dispensing um, patterns of patients immediately after the start of follow-up. And that's exactly what we observed. So we, we remeasured the milligram morphine equivalents that patients were getting in the first 60 days of follow-up between the two groups. And the hypothesis here would be that if we've completely controlled confounding, that is we have, we have sort of um, neutralized this, uh, this underlying pain severity and opioid consumption difference between the two groups, then their subsequent opioid consumption should be very similar into the start of fault. And actually, if anything, we might, exceed, we might expect to see that in the gabapentinoid initiators, they would have fewer MMEs, that is, they would have less opioid use because maybe the gabapentinoids are actually doing something for the pain control. Um, but in fact, what we see is the opposite. That is, we see an almost 25% higher um, use of, of opioids in the gabapentin group versus the comparators. These are, again, MMEs, but now this is on a daily basis. You can see how many daily milligram morphine equivalents patients in the gabapentinoid group are getting compared to the uh, compared to the comparators. And so this suggests to us that there are two important differences between these two groups after all of the propensity score analysis that we've done. One is getting gabapentinoids and one is not. Um, and then in the gabapentinoid group, they're also consuming more opioids than the comparators. And so from these, uh, res re these results alone, we can't separate out how much of this effect is due to the gabapentinoid versus the difference in the subsequent opioid utilization. And so we're now kind of working on a, um, a more complex analysis that will uh, better account for this measure in follow-up uh, using appropriate methods to see after we've accounted for this difference, um, what happens to these results here. But, um, but it's pretty certain that these results will come down at least to some degree and, and probably quite a bit. Okay, so I wanna leave maybe about 15 or 20 minutes for discussion. Um, and so I hope that I've impressed on you two things so far. One is that there's a lot of opportunity for things to go wrong in pharmacopoeia studies, especially when we use databases and especially um, when these data are, are, are so ubiquitous as they are today. Um, the second thing is that we can also use these same databases and try to replicate the studies that are coming out, um, but with additional sort of um, checks and balances to understand whether the results may be valid. I think there are kind of, if we think about the evidence generation process in three phases, we have what's happening in the peer review phase. So this is when the research is actually being conducted um, and there are opportunities there to improve the quality, the transparency and the reproducibility of those, uh, of those studies that are being conducted. We have the peer review process and I think there are important steps that we as a field and as a community can take to improve the peer review process to um, not only improve the studies that make it through that process, but also to serve as a sort of safety net for studies, uh, for capturing those studies that probably shouldn't proceed beyond peer review. And then there's also certain things as we've just talked about in those three use cases that we can do in the post peer review period to, um, to identify studies that may have made it into the, into the literature that are not valid. I think the most important thing that we can and need to do is we need to expand training and education in pharmacoepidemiology. I think pharmacoepidemiology continues to be um, 
uh, sort of niche in its training, but as I hope I have impressed on you, the access to the data is, it goes way beyond um, all of the, you know, the training programs in pharmacopoeia. And so now, no matter where you sit in a healthcare organization, you can have access to data, um, even if you haven't been trained on how to use them. And so I think tr the training piece really spans all three of these periods. We need to train the investigators to do these studies to avoid the problems that we've highlighted. We need to have training so that peer reviewers know how to identify studies that are flawed and know what the major um, areas, uh, uh, problematic areas could be. And then we also need to have people who are taking, who weren't involved in the peer review process, but in the post peer review stage are taking close looks at these studies and coming up um, you know, with uh, hypotheses that could refute them when that's appropriate. The other uh, sort of uh, big initiative that spans all three of these domains is that we need to increase the transparency in study reporting. So there's a really interesting initiative that's being led out of our group at Brigham and Women's by Shirley Wang that's looking at how transparent studies, database studies in pharmacopoeia are in terms of the reporting of exactly what they did. And so it's hard to know whether there are problems with the studies if there's not even enough transparency to understand what they did with the data. And so she's uh, Shirley has published a really interesting paper looking at how often do papers actually reach that scientific ideal of being able to be reproduced because they provided all sufficient detail to allow someone to replicate it. And it's a surprisingly low proportion of studies that are completely replicable because we have all of the information in the study report and appendices that are needed to do that replication. Um, and so we need more transparency in the study reporting exactly how we're getting from the database to the final results and uh, including even where the data come from, which is another uh, controversy that has erupted within the COVID context, which I'd be happy to talk about as well. Um, but going from where the, you know, the generation of the data all the way to the final publication. And then within each of these three uh, sort of periods, I think there are very specific things that we can and should be doing to increase quality um, to ultimately uh, resolve some of the bias that we are observing. So one is that, and this harkens back to the uh, beta blocker use case, we need to get better as a field at knowing just when we can and when we should not do an observational study. And so I would argue that none of those studies on beta blockers and COPD should ever have been conducted with claims data alone. Um, maybe you could do a better job with EHR data coupled with claims if you have good measures of COPD in lung function and smoking. Um, but I think from the start, those studies had no shot at getting it right. And I think that's what the randomized trial showed. And so there's a, an initiative called RCT Duplicate that's trying to replicate randomized trials using electronic health care data to understand what are the characteristics of the trials or of the studies um, that enable us to actually get the right answers with pharmacopoeia, um, that is with administrative databases and EHR data. And this will help guide us in understanding where we should be focusing our attention on what are the right questions to, to try to answer and which ones should we just avoid altogether. Um, the next thing is that the, I, I have lots of ideas on what we should be doing with peer review. I think there are a lot of things that need to happen for us in pharmacopoeia where we're starting is that one of the big issues as I see it is that journal editors don't know um, as going back to kind of the perils of pharmacopoeia don't know necessarily who um, can help them separate the wheat from the chaff. That is they don't necessarily know who are expert in understanding the nuances of the databases that we use in pharmacopoeia and uh, nuances of the methods as well. And so as part of the International Society of Pharmacoepidemiology and together with Christopher Wrench, who I saw on the call, um, we're thinking about trying to create a database of individuals, ISPE members who are volunteering to become part of a repository that we then share with journal editors so that when they have a pharmacopoeia study, they have a resource to go to to identify individuals who are interested in reviewing those studies and are um, perhaps better qualified than your average reviewer to know the, uh, the pitfalls of this type of work. Um, I think there's a lot more that can and should be done with peer review. Um, I'd be happy to use some of the time that we have in the next few moments to, to talk about 
how we can improve peer review. And then finally, going back to the repeat initiative uh, that is improving transparency. I think the longer term vision is that we need to enable peer reviewers to not only be able to understand what has been done in the study by increasing transparency, um, but the databases that are often being used in pharmacopoeia are available, as, as I've sort of alluded to multiple times, um, to many different research groups. And so I could envision a process where a study is published or even in the peer review process, there's a, a reproduction of the study that's done using the same database by a peer reviewer or by an external research group that has access to the same data. And they try to replicate the study. Um, so this will and immediately sort of address two issues. One, is the reporting of the study transparent enough to be able to replicate that? So we'll get a good sense at that stage. Two, doing the analysis that the author said they did, um, does that get us to the same or very similar answer? And then three, once that, that system is in place, we have that platform, we have that study replicated, it becomes very easy then to begin to build in some of these very simple detection approaches that we've talked about. So you can then do robustness checks of the analyses by looking at, okay, if we actually build in a negative control outcome here, which the authors didn't do, do what do we see? Is that now an indication that there might be bias? Or what if there's an important sensitivity analysis that the authors let, let off, left off? Could we, um, could we implement that at this stage and understand um, whether their results are, are sensitive to some assumptions they made or are they robust? And I think right now we're inching our way towards being able to do this in the post peer review process. That is the three studies that um, the three use cases that I described are examples of that. But I think as we get more efficient, I could imagine that migrating even into the peer review process so that we have almost in parallel a um, replication or re producibility exercise that's happening even before the paper is published. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. We have plenty of time. Here's just a screenshot of repeat. Um, uh, maybe I'll just quickly say that um, the, the overall project, and I think this is why it's such a useful framework for the solution that, that we're discussing is that it's set up to be able to quickly replicate studies uh, in ad administrative claims data. There's a goal by the end of the project to replicate 150 studies. Uh, the research team has already replicated 141. So there's, it's kind of demonstrated that at least at a process level, something like this is possible. Um, there will of course be lots of additional political and logistical challenges that we have to address, but at least at a process level, I think something like that could be possible. So I'll stop there. I look forward to any questions, comments, or further discussion that you all have.